Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. From the right, I'm Gary Pollard. And from the left, I'm David Jones. Tonight we welcome the author of the book, The Autobiography of an Execution, University of Houston Distinguished Law Professor David R. Dow. Welcome, Professor Dow. Thank you. Nice to be here. This book, David R. Dow, um, it came about because you have a job to do, uh, trying to keep people off of death row. Where are you practicing that type of law? I practice that law in two places. I run a death penalty clinic at the University of Houston. And I'm also the director of litigation at an organization called the Texas Defender Service, which is a nonprofit legal aid corporation that works exclusively on capital cases. And so I work with lawyers there, and I work with students here at the University of Houston. And how are these operations funded? They are funded in part by the courts, which means you, the federal courts or the state courts appoint us, and then the taxpayers pay the bills. They're funded in part by private donation and in part by foundation grants. Now, you've written other books, and yet I, I would venture to say that you are probably pleasantly surprised at, at the reaction to this one. Why, why do you think this one mattered more to people than uh, the other ones that you've written? I targeted this book to what I thought was an educated and interested broad audience. It's not a specialized book. I think that it tends to stay away from jargon. And in addition to that, it's not really a polemical book. It's not so much a book about the death penalty per se as it is about what it is like to be a death penalty lawyer and to try to put together my life as a death penalty lawyer with my life as a husband and a father. And you insist that this book is based on true events, and, and, and real people, real occurrences, and yet there's not, a, there's not a name in here that we will recognize other than you, your son, and your wife, right? That's, I think, mostly true. There might be one or two names. It's a fairly long cast of characters, but in general, I change the name of every one of my clients. I change the name of judges, prosecutors, prison guards, prison officials, and I did that for a couple of reasons. One was because I really didn't want discussions about the book to turn into a discussion of particular cases. I didn't want to be rehashing particular cases. Another was that I have obligations as a lawyer to keep the confidences of my client confidential, even, even after they've, they've died. And then a third reason, frankly, is that I continue to have many clients. And I go see my clients. I represent them zealously. I wouldn't want my current clients to think that their names are going to be in some future book that I might write. Well, David, let, let's talk about uh, the reason you have this side the side business, I guess, is this, or side occupation, because you're a law professor, and I, I take it you teach law students here at the University of Houston. Yes. Okay. You have this because we have the death penalty in Texas and in other states in the United States. The first question I ask you is, do you think, in your opinion, not from a moral standpoint, but from the standpoint that is usually sold on the death penalty, it's a deterrent. It stops, it stops other people from committing capital crimes. Do you think that's accurate? Oh, no. I'm certain that it's not accurate. It used to be that about 75% of the people on death row in Texas were there for what's called a felony murder, which means that they committed a murder while they were carrying out another felony. Now, it doesn't really matter how you're murdered. If you're murdered, you're just as dead either way. But it matters, I think, from the point of view of deterrence because somebody who commits a felony murder is not somebody who woke up that morning planning to kill somebody later that day. It's somebody who woke up that morning planning to rob a bank or rob a convenience store. And most convenience store robberies don't involve any loss of life. Somebody goes into a convenience store and shows a gun to the clerk and walks out with money. Some of them, however, spiral in a direction that the bad guy didn't plan, didn't anticipate, didn't expect. And those are the cases where somebody dies, and those are the cases where you can't possibly deter the person because the person had never intended to carry out the crime uh, in the first place, intended to rob the store, but didn't intend to kill anybody. So you think maybe the Chinese have a better idea? Because in China, if you're a drug dealer, you can get the death penalty, and the death penalty is executed pretty quickly after you have your trial. So do you think the Chinese have a better idea in using the <coughs> death penalty, assuming morally you're okay with it? I, I used to think that 
if we were going to have the death penalty, and maybe you can push me in the direction of still thinking this, but I used to think that if we're going to have the death penalty, we really ought to reserve it for the crimes that are perpetrated by the most thoughtful people. Who do those people tend to be? Those people tend to be the people who do things like insider trading on Wall Street. I promise you that if you executed a single insider trader on Wall Street, you would not have Ivan Bosky problems anymore. They would all stop doing insider trading because those are people who read the newspaper, they make rational calculations, and you can't make enough money to offset the possibility that you're going to be executed the day after you're convicted of insider trading. So I think that that is, to some extent, the idea that the Chinese have. I used to think that would work. The fact that the Chinese have to execute so many people makes me think that maybe it wouldn't work after all. The Chinese do, in fact, business people, execute business people who engage in corruption where that corruption leads to loss of life. And yet it seems that they do have to do it more than once. Do you hear the argument made by uh, Gary and his crowd that, you know, we have to have an orderly society and, and punishment is part of it. Uh, capital punishment is, is part of that uh, punishment framework. And, you know, if, it, if our society is going to be organized and we make a mistake every once in a while, well, so be it. Because the payoff is that everybody's going to be a little more worried uh, about landing in that system. Anybody b- a- say those things to you? Well, I don't know that it's only Gary's crowd <laughs> that says those things. I mean, you wouldn't be against punishment. We do have to have punishment. I mean, the, the, the role of the state is to keep all of us safe. I'm not against punishment. There are some of my clients who I believe could live outside of prison without presenting any great risk to society, but there are other of my clients who I think should spend the rest of their natural lives in prison. So I really think that it's both sides of the debate who care about safety. I think really the question is whether you get any incremental additional safety by carrying out an execution rather than putting somebody in prison for the rest of his life. And I think the answer to that is no. Unless it's an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, and the biblical admonition. But let's talk about another thing. State of Texas is facing financial problems, uh, the recession or whatever other excuses people want to make, but the budget's tight. Yes. Is the death penalty more expensive to use and use in, in the instance we use them as opposed to leaving the people who deserve to be in prison for life, leaving them there? It's much more expensive. We don't know precisely how much more expensive in Texas because there, frankly, aren't good studies. There are good studies in other states. And in other states, we know that to execute somebody costs somewhere between two and a half and four times as much as keeping that person in prison for the rest of his life. I'd be surprised if Texas was really far away from that number. But even if it's just two to one, even if you spend twice as much money on a death penalty case as you would on a non-death penalty case, that's still a lot of money. And in times when budgets are tight, that's certainly an area where the state could save money by accepting life sentences rather than death sentences. One of the things that some lawyers in my office do, I myself am principally an appellate lawyer, but there are some lawyers in my office who work mostly on trials. And they have great success by going to the district attorney before the trial even starts and saying, we'll plead to a life sentence and it'll cost you zero additional dollars. And in many counties... Not in Harris County so far, but in many other counties, district attorneys eagerly snap at those offers. Let me, let me give you uh, this hypothetical. Let's assume that Barack Obama is reelected. Let's further assume that in his next term, two conservative justices retire or pass away somehow or another, giving him two appointments, making it, say, roughly a 6-3 more moderate to liberal uh, majority Uh, What argument do you think would motivate that six-member majority to end the death penalty? I doubt that there's really any. I don't think that in my lifetime the Supreme Court is going to strike the death penalty down. I think that what will happen is that the states will abandon the death penalty. There may be some state courts who declared unconstitutional under state law, but I would be extremely surprised if the Supreme Court were to broadly uh, strike the death penalty down. Let me tell you why. The Justices in recent years who have been the most outspoken critics of the death penalty, the ones who have basically abandoned the death penalty and said it's unconstitutional, were the most conservative justices. I mean, the two who did it were Justice Blackmun and Justice Stevens. Now, I know that people think that Justice Stevens was a liberal, but when the Supreme Court reinstated the death penalty in 1976, it was Justice Stevens, along with uh, two other justices, Justice Stewart and Justice White, 
who wrote the, Justice Powell, I'm sorry, who wrote the central opinions upholding the death penalty. When the Supreme Court reinstated the death penalty in 1976, there were five cases. They upheld the death penalty in three, struck it down in two. There were only two justices who voted to uphold all five of those death sentences, and one of them was Justice Blackmun, who then 20 years later just said, I give up. We can't possibly have a constitutional death penalty. It's interesting to me that it's been in the history of the Supreme Court, the modern Supreme Court at any rate, the conservative justices who have given up on the death penalty and decided the state just can't do this properly, it can't do it well, it can't do it fairly, so we just need to abandon it altogether. Uh, David, in your experience and in, in which you've, different agencies you've worked with and the number of cases you've worked on, do you think that Texas has executed innocent people in the past? Oh, of course. I don't think that any rational person could avoid that conclusion. We know that there have been many innocent people put in prison for all types of crimes, and the notion that they've been put in every prison unit in the state, in every wing of every prison in the state, but somehow have never been on death row. We know that they've been on death row because we've had people exonerated from death row, so you would have to believe that we've caught every single one just in the nick of time to believe that we've never executed an innocent person. I think it's preposterous. I really do think that an honest death penalty supporter needs to just bite the bullet on that and say, yeah, of course we're going to execute innocent people from time to time, but that's just a price you have to pay. Justice Scalia has said that. Justice Scalia has said, of course we're going to execute innocent people, but if the states want to do it, the states can do it. Let me ask you this, David. Yeah. Can, we, can we see a day maybe when the Supreme Court says to the legal community that, you know, the standards for legal services to people charged with capital crimes is going to be so high? Uh, that the numbers of death uh, penalty uh, trials and convictions start dropping? Well, that's already happened. I mean, that's already happened. In 2010, there were eight new death sentences in Texas. In 2009, there were nine new death sentences in Texas. So nine two years ago, eight last year. That compares to 35, 40, 45 new death sentences a year in the early 1990s. So in a period of 15, 20 years, we've gone to 30 or 40 new death sentences a year to seven or eight or nine new death sentences a year. I think that's already happened, even in Texas. Really, the only way that Texas is different from the rest of the country, the, in the whole country, the number of new death sentences has declined steeply. The only respect, really, in which Texas is different is that Texas just continues to execute a whole bunch of people. When I started doing this work 20 years ago, Texas and California both had death rows of about the same size. They were both about 350, 400 people. And here it is 20 years later, and Texas's death row is about 340, and California's is over 700. How did that happen? Well, the way that happened is that during those 20 years, Texas executed 450 people. So Texas is different in the sense that it executes a lot of people. I don't think that it's so different in terms of the people who sit on juries who have to decide whether somebody's going to be sentenced to death. Why is Harris County so different? We have a, had a huge number of people uh, come out of this county, uh, both executed and on death row, probably, what, a third or a half of the population. All of the exonerees that you read about come from other counties and not from this one. Uh, have we done a better job of, 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 of fairer allocation of, of the punishment of death, of the, of death uh, in Harris County? Well... Two questions there, I guess. In, in the first place, I just have to disagree with the premise. There have been many exonerees from Harris County. One of the reasons that there have not been as many exonerees from Harris County as there have been from some other counties of comparable size is that Harris County doesn't save the evidence. I mean, if, if we want to look into a case from <laughs> Dallas County that's 30 years old, they have the evidence, and all we got to do is get the evidence and test it. If you want to look into a case that's 30 years old from Harris County, there's not a chance you're going to find the evidence. It was all thrown into some room with a whole bunch of evidence from other cases and all mixed up. I mean, that's all related, you know, to the crime lab scandal. So I think that part of the reason there aren't as many exonerations from Harris County is just because of the raw material for establishing the innocence of somebody who's in prison uh, isn't there. But on the other point, the truth is that death sentences have declined in Harris County, too. I mean, there was a, you know, a high-profile case, what, three or four years ago where an illegal uh, immigrant shot and killed a police officer, and a Harris County jury, in all cases, returned a life sentence in that case. The idea that you have a Harris County jury returning a life sentence in a cop killing involving somebody who's here illegally, I think, speaks, speaks volume. Uh, you, are you trying to set a standard for lawyers uh, in the book? And the reason I'm bringing this up, in the book you talk about 
you know, how you're the last person between that client and lethal injection. And then there's another kind of lawyer who's, you know, just on, uh, on the team and, and, and sending them on uh, to the inevitability of, of that injection. And you say one of those strategies is healthier for the lawyer uh, than the other. Uh, so are you asking too much of your colleagues? Well, here's what happens when you get appointed to represent a death row inmate in federal court. There is a judge who signs an order appointing you to represent somebody under a statute, under a provision of federal law. And that provision of federal law says all of the things that you're supposed to do. <laughs> and they include representing that inmate up until the very end, raising every non-frivolous legal claim that you can raise, whether it's in state court or federal court or clemency proceedings. So I think really what I'm saying in the book is that lawyers who accept these appointments ought to do what federal law says they're supposed to do. Is it healthier not to? Is it healthier to never go visit your client so that when the person gets executed, the person who's being executed is somebody who you don't even know? Is it healthier not to raise claims that might irritate the judges who have to adjudicate those disputes? Sure, it's healthier for the lawyer who's involved. It's not healthy, certainly, for the client, and it's not healthy for the legal system. There, I are, think. there are two names that are in the book for, that are real people, the wife and the kid. Yes. Has this been good for them, I guess is a better question, the standard that you're, uh, you're under? Well, I think you and Gary would have to have Katya and Lincoln on the show and ask them that question. I, I'll try to take a stab at an answer, and my stab at the answer is um, I, th I think that it's been difficult on them at times, but I think that it would be worse for them if the person who was sharing the same roof was somebody who felt like he was abandoning his clients and wasn't working as hard as he should be working, ought to be working, to save his clients. One of the things that non-lawyers uh, involved in the criminal justice system often ask is, how can you do this? How can you represent these murderers and these uh, felony murderers and the rapist murderers, the, the, the dregs of society? How can you do that, especially when you know they're really guilty? So, what? That's a great question. And I had that question myself when I first started doing this work. It was all predicated on the belief that all of the people who I was going to meet were, in fact, going to be accurately described by that list of adjectives that you just offered up in describing them. And one of the first things that I learned is that that list of adjectives doesn't really describe most of them. Most of them are not Hannibal Lecter type characters who are figments of some author's imagination. They are real human beings who in many ways were broken by our society. They were broken because of the circumstances in which they grew up. They're, many of my clients are people who should have been taken out of their homes when they were four, five, six years old and they weren't. They were in many ways abandoned by society. Now, I don't say any of this to excuse what they did. I think that I'm pretty clear in the book that I'm not a very forgiving person. It's not part of my job description to excuse people, but it is part of my job to try to understand how and why A caused B. And for most of my clients, when you put together their lives, you can understand how it is that they grew up without empathy. Now, many of them develop empathy once they're in prison, and it's not just one of the myths is that, oh, yes, well, they all find religion because they're close to the needle. That's not what it is at all. I'll tell you what it is. What it is is that these guys spend 23 hours a day in a 60-square-foot cell mm. without a television, with a radio that gets maybe a couple of stations. Now, I love to read, but if you put me in a 60-square-foot room with nothing but a big pile of books, after about a week, I'd be going out of my mind. My clients are people who, if they even know how to read, it's generally not something that they like to spend a lot of time doing. So what does that mean? It means that you've got 23 hours a day to sit in your cell and think about all of the ways that you've screwed up and all of the harm and pain that you've inflicted on other people. And that gets to people really quickly. And it turns even people who you thought would be hard and cold until the very end into deeply remorseful human beings. The, the, the question that Yuri asked was also raised in the book, I think, and I, I believe it was in a, uh, in a discussion with your wife where the, she raised the question, 
uh, why you keep doing it. And, and if you forgive me, I'll quote her. Uh, she says that uh, you are uh, racked with guilt when you contemplate stopping, and anything else would be unfulfilling and self-indulgent. She, uh, does, she have that, does she have that right? Yes. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I tried to quit a couple of times. Uh, one time I quit for about 10 months. Another time I didn't make it quite so long. And the next time I quit, it lasted about 10 days. And both of those times, I felt like I was not spending my life in a way that um, was a better way to spend it. You know, I just, I, I, I felt like I could be doing something else that was more satisfying, more fulfilling to me, and that I thought, you know, was more important. So, yeah, I think she has that mostly right. The other thing that I would say, you know, is that if I were to quit tomorrow, if I were to get hit by a bus walking back across the street to my office at the law school, 99% of my clients would end up in the hands of perfectly terrific lawyers. So it's not really that there aren't great lawyers out there doing this work. It's that they're is this possibility that 1% of them are going to end up in the hands of people who I talk about in the book who walk away from the work. They don't really care about their clients. They're doing it just for the paycheck, not really to try to save somebody's lives. And the reason that my wife Katya says that I'd be racked by guilt is because I'm focused on that 1%. Are the people that you see coming into your clientele, are they, are they, aren't they mostly sort of the underclass? Gary called them the dregs. Uh, 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 I just gave uh, a description of the death penalty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and is there any part of you that, that says, you know, in doing this work, that you're sending a message to the broader culture and society that, you know, we need to do something about those that are left behind? Yes, and I think that that was implicit in a point that Gary and I were just talking about a couple of moments ago where I was suggesting that I, I think the role of society is, the role of the state is to keep us safe. I don't think executing people keeps us safe, but I'll tell you something that the state could do that would keep us safe. Something that the state could do that would keep us safe or make us safer would be to intervene in dysfun deeply dysfunctional. I'm not talking about typical dysfunctionality. The state should intervene in deeply dysfunctional homes much earlier than it does. It ought to take kids away from parents who are abusive, whether it's physical abuse or psychological abuse or what have you. And I think that if the state were to do that, it would obviously be taking mostly low-class, lower-middle-class kids away. That, that's true. But those are the kids who are going to end up in the criminal justice system without adequate representation down the road. There was, a, there was an effort to have the yeah. death penalty declared unconstitutional, as I recall, because of uh, preponderance of evidence about it being racially discriminatory. And I think it was a five to four vote went the other way. Yes. Uh, could that be revisited, do you think? That was the McCleskey decision decided in the mid-1980s. And what the party on death row proved in that case was that race matters in death penalty cases. It matters whether the murderer is black versus white, and it really matters whether the murderer's victim is black versus white. The Supreme Court upheld the death penalty anyway, and the reason that it did is because it ruled that the statistics didn't really prove that in some particular case there was discrimination. That was one of the cases where Justice Powell said he voted the wrong way. Mm -hmm. That case could just as easily have been five to four in the opposite direction. I think the racial discrimination that was present in that case, which was decided in the mid-1980s, 25 years ago, is not quite so pronounced today but it's still awfully pronounced. The number of people who were on death row in Texas, for example, who were white, who were there for killing a black person, you can count on one hand, and you don't need to use your thumb, and you don't need to use your index finger. So statistics like that tell you everything you need to know about the role that race plays in the death penalty well, system. Unless you look at the universe of potential cases that could have been filed as capital cases, and then you can t tell you that. No, even looking at that, even looking at that, that but blacks and whites, Gary, are victims of homicide in about equal number. If you look at all the victims of homicide, blacks and whites are victims of homicide in equal number. If you look at all the people who were executed, 80% of them were executed for killing a white person. There just isn't any getting around the fact that the death penalty system is, as it operates, a racist institution. Now, why is that? Is it because prosecutors are racists and they're only charging certain crimes 
as race cases? I don't think so. Is it because jurors are racists and they're you know looking to punish black people more harshly than white people? I don't think so. I think that there are a confluence of factors that result in that demographic. But you look at the demographic, and as one of the great law professors, Lon Fuller, said, he said, sometimes you can over-explain the obvious. And what he means by that is that sometimes the numbers just speak for themselves. And when you have blacks and whites being victims of homicide in equal numbers, and you have 80% of the people being executed, executed for killing a white person, it tells you everything you need to so know. So, David, I guess if we get rid of the death penalty, we won't have to worry about that, right? <laughs> Let's have some more fun uh, than we're having uh, thus far by talking about reactions to the book. Where have you been? It's time to wrap. This thing has been published uh, in various places. David. <laughs> and it looks to me like <laughs> Harry wants up. to stop talking. <laughs> it looks like time is yeah. up, David. I'm Thanks, sorry. Man. That's all right. Oh, you're I've, a great guest. I've had a lovely time. We enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> and you can watch it again if you want uh, by going online at HoustonPBS.org. <laughs> Click on the local program bar, red, white, and blue. Read about the guests, the follow-up discussion. And until next time, get informed and get active. <laughs>